Well, I'm going to ask you guys to remember a sermon two weeks ago. Anybody remember what we talked about? We talked about the covenants. Remember, a covenant is a contract or a thing that you do, that you make. You have the New Testament, the Old Testament. You have a covenant. You have many covenants in Scripture. You have the one covenant with Noah, which we're going to talk about. And then we have one covenant that Jesus gave us at his death and his resurrection. But today I'm going to talk about the emerald rainbow. And I was thinking about how to do this. What I'm starting and what I'm getting on is it's time for the church to claim and reclaim the rainbow. It is not a pagan thing. It is not an unbiblical thing. Now they have turned it to an unbiblical act. But the rainbow is a covenant that God made with Noah and with us. But it's been perverted by people that have been washed by the world, and we've got churches that are afraid to talk on it. So, if I offend you, too bad. The rainbow is, does not represent the LBGT and the alphabet. The rainbow represents a promise that God gave Noah that he would never flood the earth again. And we're going to go to Revelations 4, 2 and 3 in a minute. And it, in Revelations 4, 2 and 3, it talks about a rainbow in heaven behind the throne of God. It's an emerald, it's green. The color symbolizes life in scriptures. When we talk about the rainbow, we are dealing with a covenant. We're dealing with the promise that God gave and not what man has made. God made a covenant with Noah by the sign of the rainbow in the heavens. By the way, anybody know what the word, the name Noah actually means? It seems kind of strange that he was named Noah and had to go through the flood. It means rest and grace. Do you think Noah had rest building an ark that he'd never seen before? Can you imagine trying to build something that you have never seen? If somebody tells you, go build a truck and you've never seen a truck before, and I give you directions on how to build it, wouldn't that be still difficult? To do anything. Build a desk. Try to do something without what, looking at something first. Noah is a picture of a people who came out of the old world dominated by a curse of sin, and it shows us going into a new world. What does that have to do with us? By coming into the ark, the ark is always a type of Jesus. The ark represents the same thing as Jesus Christ when we came to him. Noah and his family got into the ark. Now, many people say, well, they escaped judgment. Actually, they didn't. They were in judgment. They were just protected by the ark. We as Christians, we are in the ark of Jesus Christ. We're still in the world. We're still in the, the, in the troubles of the world, but we're protected by the ark called Jesus by his blood. They heard the winds and the arcs and everything that happened when that rain came. Can you imagine being in a closed ark? As a matter of fact, when we go down to the ark, you're going to see how big it was. It's amazing what you can find and what you see. And can you imagine building that without modern tools, without power tools. I was talking to Bob. We're doing a, a door this week. I said, can you imagine how long it would have taken us to do this if we didn't have power tools? I mean, can you imagine how long it would take to do a simple hanging of a door? You know, I love that power drills, screwdrivers. Can you imagine sitting there? But they did it without anything. So, what is this? So let's look at, look at Revelations 2 through 4. Immediately I was in the There was like a jasper and a sardis stone in appearance, and there was a rainbow around the throne in appearance like an emerald. Around the throne were 20 four thrones, and on the thrones I saw 24 elders sitting. So in heaven, there's a what? A, a rainbow. And 
it talks about it being green. There's an importance here of the color. When we realize that we are in the ark, that we are in the ark, when we realize that we are in Christ Jesus, and that when we realize that judgment is being passed on this world today, but yet we are being protected by the blood. The family, Noah's family, did not escape judgment. They did not, not escape it or not have to deal with it. They had to go through it. They had to be in the ark when the wind and the rain, everything was hitting the side of the ark. Can you imagine that point? You're floating. You're moving around. You have no control. You have no rudder. You have no power. You have no sails. You have nothing. You're at the mercies of the wind. Can you imagine how much trust that is to get yourself in a box, close the box up, and let the winds carry you wherever it wants to carry you? But they were protected, and they were directed. It's the same thing with us today. We are protected. We are guarded by the blood of Jesus. They were safe, and so are we. I don't know what turmoils you're all going through. Everyone has their own turmoils. Everyone has their own problems. You know... Sometimes it's just coffee ain't hot enough. You know, the worst thing in the morning is to drink a cup of coffee and it's cold. Except for you weirdos that like cold coffee. <laughs> but you know, what bothers us and what turmoils that we go through are different from each person. But they were safe. Isn't it great that we can get into a vehicle called Jesus Christ? Leave this world that's dominated by sin and giants and things of the world and come into a new existence through the righteousness of Jesus. Our new world began when we accepted Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. We began a new world then. Our past is forgotten. Our past is gone. Somebody coming to me and complaining and telling me, I know what you did in the past. You know what? If you've got that problem, there's a guy, there's a cross 2,000 years ago that all of those sins were nailed to. Go deal with that. Because me, myself, I have been set free. I've entered the ark. That flood, that water, that rain, that wind is not bothering me anymore because I'm protected by the blood of Jesus. When we see that we are not just one man, it is not just one man that hung on that cross. Because those of us that are Christians, we were there. When Jesus hung on that cross, he died saying, Father, forgive them. Forgive Jim Loft. I was born 2,000 years later, but Jesus Christ was right there. And I, everybody that was in the Christians, was right there at the cross with him. His death was our death. His crucifixion was our crucifixion. His burial was our burial. But when we answer the riddle of all the ages, it will change our lives completely. Something from within will come out. Something will move and move us and change in us. The invisible will become visible. You will become a different person. People will start seeing that you are a different, a newborn and the knowledge of the glory of the Lord will fill the earth as the waters cover the seas. We have the opportunity to reach out and be that covering and that washing. We are in that situation today. The rainbow speaks of the covenant. When we accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, we enter into that contract. That covenant with our Lord, it is settled forever. Before the foundations of the world, Jesus has shed his blood. He knew the moment that you were born that the opportunity for you to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior will be given unto you. But you have to make that choice. Just like those eight people entered the ark. They had to make a choice. The ark is built. The door is open. Were they safe? Not until they go through that door. Not until they got into the ark. And not until the door was closed. 
Have you entered the ark of Jesus Christ through the I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except by me? Are you going through that door? Is that door sealed by the blood of Jesus, by the Holy Spirit? Are you sealed inside the life of Jesus Christ? We know that once we accept in Revelation 13, 8, when we accept Jesus, said we enter into that covenant before the foundations. So God has set a plan for each one of us. When a person gets married in the natural world, he enters into a covenant. Do you understand? Matter of fact, a comment on Saturday morning. Are we not the bride? Are we not married to Jesus Christ? Do we not have a contract, a covenant with him? But to literally experience that covenant, the full sense of the word, it is when we come out of the holy place, out from where we are, out from the places, and we enter into the holy of holies, when we actually go through the door. There's three doors in the covenant, three doors in the tabernacle. There's one on the outside that you come through, in the tabernacle, you first thing you see is the, the altar, the cross of Jesus. Then there's another door that brings you into the holies. In the holies, you have Jesus, you have the fire, you have the light, you have the bread. But then you need to go to the third door, which is in the holy of holies, coming to the presence of an almighty God, the one that spoke you into existence. We have that blood covering and the authority to go into that place. But if you never enter there, are you walking and doing what the Lord told you? We know this is what happened in the book of Ruth, how she married the Redeemer, how she, her land was redeemed. In the Song of Solomon, it talks about the green room. It talks about the marriage. It talks about the love that a couple has. If you read Song of Solomon and you put Christ in there, it will explain to you the love that Christ has for us. Are we going into that green room? Are we going into that place, that intimacy with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ? Or are we just sitting on the outside looking out? There's a paradoxical truth here. We are married to the Lord at our initial salvation, but we do not know it by experience, until we come into face-to-face -face with our Lord and Savior. Our experience must go through certain protocols. In the ark of Noah, there was a window on the roof. It's interesting, whenever they had to look out, they had to look up. We are to look up directionally to heaven, but also dimensionally. We are to look not to our left or right, but through the Lord and through the Holy Spirit and that the, our spiritual eyes should be opened. Our redemption draweth nigh. We're redemptive when we experience the presence of God. Many people have said, well, I'll just say, Lord, Lord, you're my Savior. I accept Jesus Christ and does not have that experience. That's like saying, sweetheart, will you marry me, but never go to the courthouse and never sign the document. <clears throat> asking is not marriage. Marriage is commitment. Marriage is not assigning a piece of paper. It's a commitment between one man and one woman. That is marriage. And marriage takes you further than just the thrills. It's great when you first marry. And then the years come. And all of a sudden, your wife looks at you and says, man, you're not the guy I thought I was marrying. You're better. <laughs> we are in the ark as we are in Christ. We are with him at the cross of Calvary. The full judgment of God has beat upon us, beat upon Jesus, and has beat the full judgment of God was thrown against Jesus Christ on the cross. And we were there. But yet he was there as our ark to protect us from those attacks, from that wave, from that judgment. We know what happened to the world. Every man, every woman, every person died except for eight. 
those that entered into the ark. It's going to happen again one day when Jesus Christ comes and that trumpet is sound and the Jews, those in Christ, will meet him in the heavens, but only those that know Jesus, only those that have gone through that door will be able to come and claim Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior. Because then it'll be too late. Just like the people in the times of Noah, when that door was closed, there was no more room for salvation. They all died in the flood. Why? Because they did not obey God. They knew. They understood. You got to understand the times of Noah. Noah's great-grandfather was alive during the time of Noah. They knew. It's like talking about your great-grandparents. That was Adam and Eve. They were so close to Adam and Eve. They were so close to the garden. But yet, they could not understand, and they rebelled against God. When we understand what took place, and we look up and see what happened at that cross, our eyes will truly be open. The preaching of the cross is the wisdom of God. It is the power of God. Paul determined to know nothing save Christ and his crucified. When we look and beyond the dimension and we see John as he saw, we'll see what happened at the cross. We will begin to see and never see things that we've seen before. We will never look at things the same. We will be different. We will see the big picture. We will see that the Bible and its redemption is true no matter what History Channel tells you. No, Jesus was not an alien from a spaceship from the planet Osiris. It was not a spaceship that took Elijah to heaven. God took him to heaven. Look at the big picture. Look at what was going on. I wonder what the people were thinking when the ark was closed and it started to rain. It never rained before. It never rained before. Can you imagine what would happen? What do you think they were going through? I wonder what their thoughts were about. I wonder if they said, oh man, we better get into the ark. But that door was already closed. And I wonder if the door has closed on many people today. There are many people suffering around the world. There's genocide going on in Africa today. I wonder if they had the opportunity to go through that door. E.W. Bollinger writes in his book, Numbers of Scriptures, when the waters abated, it was Noah, the eighth person that stepped out, 2 Peter 2, 5, who stepped out onto this new earth, a new beginning, and a new order of things. Eight souls came out of that ark. 1 Peter 3.20, pass through it with him to the new regenerated word. Eight is a number of new beginnings. It is a number of his name, Jesus, in the Hebrew and in the, in the Greek. When you give a numerical numbers to it, it's eight, eight, eight. Eight for the body, eight for the soul, and eight for the spirit. Mount Ararat was a curse revealed. Jesus was a fulfillment, a completion. When the waters receded, they, were, they landed on Mount Ararat, which means, the word actually means the curse is reversed. Landed, and the curse of what was happening before Noah was reversed. The light of this led, let us read Genesis 6, 14 through 17. It's on page 12 of your pew Bible. Make yourself an ark of gopher wood, Make rooms in the ark and cover inside and out with pitch. And this is how you shall make it. The length of the ark shall be 300 cubits in width, 50 cubits in height, 30 cubits long. You shall make a window for the ark and you shall finish it with cubic from above and set the door on the ark on the, ins on the side. You shall make it with lower levels and the third deck. Think about it. First of all, Make the wood out of what wood? Gopher wood. There was a Pacific. Make it a certain size. The length, the size. Noah is to make the ark of gopher wood. It is the beginning of, you think about it, of cutting down trees. 
That is the beginning of the sacrifice. A tree, once you cut it, when it's cut from the source, it's no longer alive. So it starts with the killing of the trees. Right there, death, because the tree is cut off of its life source. Wood speaks of humanity in Scripture. Jesus was cut out of the land of the living on what? On an old rugged tree, on an old rugged cross. It'd be interesting, we don't know, the Scriptures don't tell us, I wonder what kind of wood the cross was. If I was a betting man, I'd say it'd be what? What wood was the ark made out of? Gopher wood. Just saying. It's not scripture. Noah makes rooms in the ark with pitch and with from within and without. You ever heard, know what the word pitch actually means in Hebrew? Atonement. Atonement. What does atonement mean? Have you been atoned for your sins? So the ark was to be covered inside and out with atonement. Are you washed inside and out with the atonement of Jesus Christ? Not only on the outside, but on the inside. It's a type of spiritual sealant as the ark was the precious blood of Jesus. In verse 15, the length of the ark is 300 cubits. The number is a, it means a complete deliverance. 300 means complete deliverance. The breadth is 50 cubits. We know what 50 stands for, the Pentecost. The law was given on the 50th, on 50th day when they were set free. The height is 30 cubits, which means maturity. Jesus didn't start his ministry until he was 30 years old. 30 years was the age of maturity for the Jewish people. In verse 16, we see that there was three levels in the boat. There was an outer court, an inner court, and a holy of holies. Everything resembles what we study in the ark, and we study in the tabernacle, and we study with Jesus Christ and the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Notice the window was not on the third story. It was on top, the roof meaning, look up for your redemption. Look up to the Lord, not to your left or to your right, because those sitting next to you are not going to bring you redemption. Only Jesus Christ, and you can only find him in the heavenly places and when the Holy Spirit comes to you. It is not looking in direction, but looking dimensionally. Noah has made the door. There's one door in the ark. One door. There's only one way into that ark. And it is through that door. And today there's only one door to Jesus Christ. And it's through Jesus Christ. In Genesis chapter 8, Noah first sent out the raven. It's interesting how everything is happening. Everything is matching scriptures. And then the raven is sent out. Noah opens the window and sends out the raven. Which went forth to and fro until the waters were dried up from the face of the earth. It never returned. As many people, they were in the ark. The raven was in safe area. The window was open. He was released and never returned. Are you a raven today? Have you met Jesus Christ and you went back into the world and never returned? It is time to come back to the Lord Jesus Christ. There's a lot of gold nuggets here. I don't have time to go through every one of them. But for now, let me say that the raven is seen in the book of Revelation. It re represents unclean spirits. In Revelation 18, we see that Babylon has become the habitation of every foul spirit and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. Do you have those thoughts today? It's like the raven running around. Your mind is everywhere except where it needs to be. Then Noah sent out forth a dove to see if the waters had abated from the face of the earth. The first time he sent out the dove, it came back. In Revelation 18, we see that Babylon had nothing to do with their redemption. We see that Babylon has nothing to do with the raven. The dove did what? Went out and returned. Where are we? The second time, seven days later, he sent out a second dove, and it came back with an olive leaf in its mouth. The third time, another seven days, the scent went out and did not return. There's going to be a time that the Holy Spirit will not return to you. You have to get it right today. 
the dove, which is a symbol of the Holy Spirit, is connected to the new world. I love what Lynn Hiles wrote about, what she says. And I love the way she wrote this. The dove goes all the way from Genesis chapter 8 to Matthew chapter 3, looking for an olive branch to land. And it finds Jesus in the river Jordan. John the Baptist understood that there were the spirit descending as a dove is where the new world begins. And the dove landed on Jesus being baptized in the Jordan River. The bird did not just not return to the ark. The bird left in, Ge in Genesis chapter 8 and finally landed in Matthew chapter 3 when Jesus, the true olive branch, was there. John the Baptist understood it. Do you understand it? This is where the new world begins. It is the new creation. He is the ark. He is where the curse is revealed. He is the new man in the Jordan River where you can identify with him. Some of us that went to Israel, we went to the Jordan. We were baptized in the Jordan. Not because the baptism didn't mean nothing, but it was just the idea that you're being baptized in the same river that Jesus Christ walked into the creator of the universe. Because if you go down with him in the waters of baptism, what you're saying is, his death is my death. The rainbow has different levels of light going through it. as three-sided vessel. There are numerous thoughts about the rainbow in Revelation chapter 4. We see the rainbow is bending the light through, three, through a prism. We, we see that there's three parts. There's spirit, soul, and body. Everything represents, it comes back to the triune God. There are three dimensions of the tabernacle, the outer court, the holy place, and the most holy. We are the temple of God. We are the outer court. We have an outer court. We have a holy place, the soul, and we have the holy of holies, the spirit of God. We are made in the image of a triune God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. To get the rainbow's light sent through a three-dimensional prism, which is what we are, are we reflecting the light of Christ when it shines through us? Our soul receives an understanding that we, it is in the spirit. We're going to have to be quickening and vibrate through our bodies so that people can see the true rainbow of Jesus Christ, not the pagan rainbow, not the rainbow of nine colors or six colors or eight colors, however they decide they want to do it today. The rainbow around the throne was green like an emerald. Green speaks of life. It is about life and not death. The L-O-B-G-T-Y alphabet Rainbow is about death because, I'm sorry to say it, two men cannot have a baby. Two women cannot have a baby. I don't care what the government says. It's biologically impossible. Follow that rainbow, it'll lead you to death. Follow the rainbow of Jesus Christ, it'll lead you to life. If you want to have a look inside of an unseen life, follow the Lamb of God and you'll see a new world. As we unlock the truth of this book, we're going to reveal more manifestation of life of Jesus Christ. When you get into the book, get into the Word of God, in our lives will be greater, the experience would be greater. When the revelation of Jesus Christ is revealed in you, you will walk, you'll walk it out. People will recognize Jesus in you. The most holy place is the green room in the Song of Solomon. That's where the bride is taken. He takes his bride into the green room, into the marriage chamber is where we need to be in the Holy of Holies. There's nothing wrong with the gift realm. It's great to be dating, but it's nothing like being married, and being in the Holy of Holies with our Lord Jesus Christ. Today, Jesus is saying, I want to take you into the green room. I want you to experience more than the holy place. I want you to experience more than the written word. I want you to have a personal experience with me. Jesus is saying, come into the holy of holies. Come into the presence of God. Come. I am calling you. 
into that place of worship. I want more than just to court you. I want, Jesus wants more than just to, uh, to get to know us. He wants us as his bride. He says, I want to marry you. I want to take you home after the date. I don't want to just drop you off at the door, give you a little kiss, and hopefully see you in a couple of weeks. He wants to take you home, to his home. He wants us to experience his presence. In the Song of Solomon, our bed became her bed. And then his bed, we finally enter into his rest. We read that in Song of Solomon, chapter 1, chapter 3, and, chapter, and 3, 7. The Lord is saying, our bed is green. It's life. Jesus is life. It's not death. Even though we go to the cross, but we don't stay at the cross. Many people today have gone to the cross. There's three aspects of the cross. There's the death. There's the burial. Then there's the resurrection. You can't stop at the cross. You've got to go to the grave site. You can't stay in the grave. You've got to be at the resurrection. You've got to be a resurrected people. He wants to birth something new in us. He wants us to come out and become a nation, a people called by Him. The only way this can happen is to realize that He has made us worthy. We are not worthy in ourselves, but we were made worthy. The nation's scriptures and scriptures in Revelation is not talking about Iraq, Iran, and Russia. They are talking about three nations. They are condemn nation, imagination, and demon nation. What nation do you belong to? Are you condemned? Are you taking on condemnation? Or is it just your imagination? Or are you just part of a denomination? He doesn't want us to neither one of those. He wants us to call him his people. It is condemnation to take, keep us, that keeps us from thinking that we're not worthy to enter into that room. That we're not worthy to be union with this God that created the world. The devil is always telling us that we are not worthy to enter into that ark. And God is saying, you are worthy because my son has made you worthy on the old rugged cross. And when he rose again on the third day, he became life. And you are no longer dead in your sins, but you're made alive in Jesus Christ. It was because of what happened in Calvary 2,000 years ago. No wedding, no intimacy. If you do not enter into the presence of God with a covenant relationship, you are not married to him. You have to have that covenant relationship with the Lord. We do not want Jezebels in our church. We don't want Jezebels in our life. We want the truth of God's word. No wedding, no intimacy. If you're not sold out 100% to God, you're not going to make it to heaven. Yes, not, you cannot play church on Sunday morning and then play the world the rest of the week. We've come into union with an experience with him. We're coming into a new aspect, a new place, a new holy of holies. We, where we begin and this, everything that we have done in the past was done away on Calvary Hill. The only thing that's left is keeping us from experiencing the most holy of holies is us. Jesus is here saying, come, here I am. The only reason you're not there is because you think you're not worthy. The rainbow has seven colors. And the seven colors of the rainbow has a purpose. The seven colors have a reason. The rainbow speaks of a covenant and the different levels of that covenant. There are seven feasts of the Lord. We talked about that in many sermons. There are seven pieces of furniture in the tabernacle of Moses. The rainbow was round about the throne. It can speak of a praise and worship of the Lord. The stone of Judah and the breastplate of the high priest was emerald. Judah represents the praise and worship. The only way we have true praise and worship is if we have and we come through the death of Jesus Christ. The first time we see worship mentioned in the Bible was when Abraham, pay attention, when Abraham took Isaac on the mountain to be sacrificed. is the first time worship is mentioned in Scripture. When we have true praise and worship, can you imagine calling that worship? You're told to take your only son 
and sacrifice him? And first mention of worship was there. Because that is true worship when the son of Jesus Christ went to the cross and hung. That is worship. That is not feelings and making us feel good. That is not parts of what we need to understand. The seven things that happen. How many of you heard of the Ten Commandments? How many of you have heard of the Ten Commandments, right? How many of you ever heard of the Seven Commandments? Well, Noah teaches mankind seven basic rules to adhere and it conforms to the colors of the rainbow. These are called the Noahite laws. There's seven of them. Thou shalt not worship idols. Thou shalt not blaspheme. Thou shalt not murder. Thou shalt not have immoral relations. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt, not res thou shalt respect all living creatures. Thou shalt set up courts of law. Those were the seven laws that Noah pronounced when he came out of the ark. Do they apply today? If you understand the moral laws, you would understand that. What's interesting is green is the middle color. Green is life. You got red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet, and all have different colors, all have different purposes. But understand there's seven colors of our rainbow. Now, Baker, the man that came up with the, the flag of the LBGT alphabet, he saw the rainbow as a natural flag from the sky, so he adopted eight colors for the stripes, each color with its own meaning, different than what it says in the scriptures. They had even added pink for sex, yellow for sunlight, green for nature, and all these other colors. But yet, what he did was, because Jesus was the eighth, Jesus was the second Adam, Jesus was the creation, Jesus meant eight. He comes up with eight colors, even though it is contrary to nature. And so is homosexual marriage, a contrary to nature. And the flag, their flag represents that. Our rainbow represents the truth of God's word. Our rainbow represents the promise, what God, the covenant that he made with mankind. And the rainbow in heaven is the, is the representation of life, not death. We need to claim back God's covenant rainbow. And you can only do that if you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Let us bow our heads and pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you, we praise you, we worship you. You are a mighty God. Lord, as we enter into the Holy of Holies, Lord, if there are people here or listening on the Internet, Lord, that do not have that intimate relationship with you, Lord, I ask that you would touch them with the Holy Spirit, Lord. Anoint them, Lord. Bring them into a realization that their sins are paid for, that they've been washed clean by the precious blood, that they are no longer held accountable for things of the past, but, Lord, that you have set them free. Lord, I ask for a special anointing on America today. Lord, we have instituted sin. We have instituted abortion. We've instituted things that are abominable that's written in Scripture. Lord, we ask for a revival in America today, a new bringing in, a new entrance, Lord, maybe a new ark that we would come and know that you are our God. In the name of Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen.